Today, we're going to be talking about blob storage. And no, I don't mean some container that you put all of your ditto Pokemon into. I mean being able to store binary large objects in the cloud. Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a Principal Software Engineering Manager at Microsoft. In this video, we're going to go over an introduction to getting Azure Blob Storage set up, and I'm going to walk through a little bit of the setup that you'll see when you're in the cloud portal, and then from there, we're going to look at a very simple C-sharp program that will let us do some of the basics using Azure Blob Storage. If that sounds interesting, just a reminder to subscribe to the channel and check out that pinned comment for my courses on Dome Train. Now, let's look at some of the setup that we have to do in the Azure portal. All right, I've gone ahead and I've taken screenshots of the various steps that we'll go through to create our storage account. So in order to get to this screen, if you're looking at the Azure services that you have available, you can even search for blob storage or storage accounts. You'll notice right at the top, this is the storage accounts classic view. And then what you'll want to do is select your subscription. So I'm using Visual Studio Enterprise subscription for mine, and then a resource group. And you can create a new one if you haven't done any of this before. From there, we're going to give it a name. I've just called my dev leader test and we're picking a region. And I should call out that as I'm walking you through this, I'm not going to be telling you the most ideal settings that you need to be using in your situation, because quite simply, I don't know your situation. And that means that you're gonna to wanna to consider all of these settings that we're gonna walk through situationally. Consider what you have going on in your current setup, maybe consult with your team, and just don't follow everything blindly. The service that I'm selecting here is the Azure Blob Storage, and then I'm just having mine as backup and archive here, but depending on your needs, there's other modes that you can select here, like if you need to have more hot access. So the idea is that you're picking between stuff that you want to store and maybe not access very much, and on the other end of the spectrum, you need to be accessing it more frequently. There are different costs associated with this. At the bottom here, we just have some performance and redundancy settings, so I'm not going to spend much time on those because, again, these are things that you're going to want to consider in your own setup. On this screen, something that I just want to focus on up at the top here because this is a bit of a trap that you can fall into if you're trying to get things set up. When it comes to being able to connect to your blob storage, we do want to make sure that you're doing things in a secure way. There is this setting here that says allow enabling anonymous access on individual containers. This is by default turned off. You probably want to keep it this way for most of the scenarios that you can think of, but I just wanted to mention that if you're having difficulty getting connected, I would try to avoid just turning off security measures. Instead, I would invest the time, go doing a little bit more research and figuring out where your problems are occurring. Because at the end of the day, if you have it all functional, but it only worked because you turned off all of the security measures, you're probably opening up yourself to some vulnerabilities. Another thing to note on this screen is at the bottom, I was talking on the previous screen about hot versus cool, and you'll see that you have that option down here to kind of alternate between those two modes. I am going to be taking a little bit of a shortcut on this third step, and I am selecting enable public access from all networks. Again, this is something that if you're thinking about how this is going to work in reality, if we have blob storage as a service in the cloud, odds are we're probably also running something else in Azure, like a server, and we want to be able to communicate with blob storage. You don't need to be able to open up public access to be able to do that. Instead, you can keep it on the same network in the cloud and basically have that internal to your cloud setup. And that way you can have your service communicating with blob storage directly without going through the public internet. By opening things up to the public, you create a whole bunch of different vulnerability scenarios. You have more surface area for people to be able to access and work with the services you have. So I would highly recommend not using this first setting. But in my situation, just to keep things very simple for this demo, I do have that checked off. I just wanted to be able to explain that so that when you're trying to make this decision, maybe if you're rapidly prototyping something and just trying to get it working, you can consider that. But in a production scenario, it's probably not something that you want to use. On this screen, I just left everything as all the defaults that you see here, but I wanted to point out that there is a concept of soft deleting both blobs and the containers. That is an option that you can play around with, something that you might want to consider for your use cases. From here, this is where I just press the review and create button at the bottom of the screen, and then we're off to the races and we can jump over to some C sharp code. But there is one more thing that we're going to want to access before we start writing code. And that is that if we go to this access keys selection here on the left, so that's under the security and networking tab, once your blob storage account has been created, you can go to security and networking and then access keys. And we are going to want to take one of these connection strings. We're going to leverage that string in our code 
coming up in just a moment. Don't forget you're going to want to copy this connection string because without this it's going to be very difficult to make a good connection to your blob storage. You're probably going to get stuck right at the beginning without this. Before we move on, this is just a quick reminder that I do have a course on C-sharp refactoring available on Dome Train. Refactoring is one of the most critical skills that you can learn as a software engineer, and this helps you continue to build upon applications that already exist, making sure that they can scale and have extensibility. I walk you through a bunch of various techniques and give you some examples that we walk through together to see how we can apply these techniques to refactor the code. Check out the pinned comment and the links in the description to get this course. Now back to the video. Heading over to Visual Studio now, the one NuGet package that I'm going to be using is Azure Storage Blobs. This is at version 12.22. Depending on when you're watching this, there may be new versions. Ideally, the APIs and stuff have not changed, or if they have, very little. So hopefully all of this conceptually still makes sense. So that's the only NuGet package I'm working with. And in this example, we're just dealing with a console application. So I do have a lot of commented code. You can kind of scroll with your eyes a little bit ahead, but I'm going to be walking through different ways that we can start by creating a container. Then we're going to be creating blobs, deleting them, reading them, all that kind of stuff coming up in just a moment. So to kick things off, we do need to have a blob service client. And that's what I have declared right at the top here. So lines three through 11 and what I've commented out or kind of hidden behind a region here, it's not commented, but it says top secret stuff. That's that connection string that I took off of the previous page that I was just walking you through where I said, don't forget to copy this. What you're going to want to do is use the URI class. So the way that you'll want to think about this is that inside of top secret stuff, I really just have new URI and then the connection string that we copied from the portal. This you could declare above and just pass connection string into here. If you pass it in as just a string because that's what you're thinking the type needs to be. It won't work. You'll probably get a couple of errors, but if you wrap it in new URI, then it should all work as you might expect. Now that we have a blob service client, we can start communicating with Azure Blob Storage. But what do we want to do from there? In Azure Blob Storage, once we have our storage account and we have the service client, what we need to be able to do is start interacting with blob containers. At this point, we've made the storage account, but we don't have any containers inside of that storage account. So if we look through lines 14 through 16 here, this is where we can either create or access a container. I'm going to take this line commented out. I'm going to put in this first line on 14. It will be very similar to line 15. So if we have the blob service client, we can say create blob container and give it a name. And there are restrictions around the name, by the way, so you'll want to look into this in the Azure documentation. I believe it's just all lowercase characters, so you can't use special characters or underscores or capitals or spaces, so something really simple like this. And the return value of this is that we're going to get a blob container client. That's going to allow us to do some more work following this. But I did want to point out that if you use the blob service client, then you can ask to create a container client and then ask it to create the container itself. So one is making a container. So in this step up here, it's making both the container in Azure storage, as well as giving you back a reference to this blob container client. Instead, you can break this out into multiple lines and create the client itself to do the work and then ask that client to create the container. So I'm going to do it all in one line. So if we were to go run this, we should be able to get a container. So let me go ahead and run it. Okay. And nothing too exciting because we're not printing anything out to the console. But if we look at line 15, if I go back to the code here, what I wanted to do, let's comment this back out. And now we should be able to get that container, right? So that means for the rest of the code, we can go check to see that we actually have that container created because if we go to access it, it would give us an error if it wasn't already made. If we go run this now, if we see no exceptions, it should mean that we have access to the container, which is great. Again, just for kind of a mental model here, we have Azure Blob Storage as a service. We made a storage account. So it's gonna be the top level part. And then we made a container, in this case, very creatively named the container. So now we have the container that we can start working with. What I want to do from here is we're going to start off by making our first file. So what I want to do on line 17 is we're going to ask the container client to give us a blob client. You'll notice that I have like a path here. And the way that blob storage works is technically you don't really have the concepts of files and folders, but the way that you can put things into the path is that you can make it feel like that. And even in Azure, 
open the portal, you can actually see that it will represent these things as folders and things for you. That doesn't really have anything to do with the underlying uh, technology, right? So this is just a unique identifier for the blob that we're going to be working with. Putting a slash in there makes it look and feel like you're dealing with a file folder hierarchy. So if we do this, we should have access to a blob. But what I'm going to do, if we look at the following lines, is I'm actually going to write hello world into there. So let's go ahead and run this and see if we get what we need in the portal. Okay, so no errors. It successfully wrote things out, but let's go prove it. All right, so I've gone into my dev leader test storage account and I've clicked on the container that was made. So that's here in the left navigation. And we can see that I have folder name. So that's going to be the first part of that path segment that I was talking about. But if I click into that, we can see that we have test.txt. So this did make a blob. It's 13 bytes long. And what do we think is inside of this? If I use the three dots on the far right hand side, I can go to view slash edit. And when I go to do that, we can see the blob is the full sort of identifier. It kind of looks like a path to us. And we can see that truly it does have hello world inside of it. So we were able to go write this blob. Now, jumping back to the code, I'm going to comment out the part that did the writing. Instead, we're going to read things back. So I'm going to use the same uh, blob identifier. Again, it looks like a path to us. I'm going to ask to read it in, and then we're going to write it to the console. Hopefully, we see hello world because we just saw that in the portal itself. There we go. Hello world. So this is us accessing that blob and reading those bytes back. I wanted to talk about a few more things that you can start to play around with as you're getting more familiar with blob storage. So in this case, we're gonna get a blob client to the same path that we were just talking about, but there's other ways that you can play around with putting data there. For example, instead of just having, in this case, uh, back up at the top where I had a stream writer that was writing text into that blob, Instead, what you might want to do is upload a file path. So you might have a local file and you just want to put that entire file to where the blob is. So you could use this one right here on line 29. This parameter is a file path locally. And if instead you want to go use a stream, you could go open up a file stream, pass that in. You could use a network stream. You could use any type of stream and this upload async will go read from that stream and write those bytes to the blob. So you have a bunch of different options to get data from wherever, as long as you have a file path or a stream, you can start sending those bytes to blob storage. Something else that we can play around with is metadata. So the more that you're getting comfortable with using Azure Blob Storage and you might want to be able to have metadata associated with the blobs that you have there, we do have options to be able to set metadata on there. So this is just going to be a dictionary of keys and values. So if we go ahead and run this, we should be able to set the metadata and check it in the Azure portal. Okay, so this ran with no exceptions. Let's go check it out in the portal now. I've gone ahead and pressed the refresh button. Then what I'm going to do is just go to properties from that three dot menu. When I pull that up, we should be able to see if I scroll down a little bit, that metadata section down here now has the keys and values that we just set in the code. Okay, the final thing that we're going to do here is we're going to take our blob client and we're going to delete that blob. So we go blob client and if I say delete and I can do delete async, there's an if exists. Uh, and there's just policies that you can delete as well. So the interesting thing about deletes that we need to talk a little bit about is this idea of snapshots. So with blob storage, you can have snapshots. If you say that you want to delete, you need to actually delete all of the snapshots as well if you truly want that file to be deleted. So I'm going to use delete if exists because it does. And there's an async version. There we go. And then the first thing, it's a kind of a long parameter here. So I'm going to try to make this fit. Give me one moment here. We'll get that trimmed up. I just need to have the using statement at the top and I'm going to say include snapshots. So we don't have any snapshots, but again, if there were snapshots, we want to delete all of the blob snapshots. So the different versions of that blob, therefore it will delete the entire blob as we would expect. So I'll put my semicolon there. I'm going to go ahead and run this and then we'll go check the portal. Okay, so no exceptions when we run this. Let's head back to the Azure portal. Now, when I go press refresh here, let's see what happens. And there we go. So if there's no file in here, but if I go back up to the container, you'll also notice that there is no folder, right? That might not be what you expected. And that's why I wanted to show you this example because the folder itself was not an entity of any kind that we created. 
it was only sort of conceptually there because the way that we named our blob, that identifier we gave it, seem to have like a file folder structure. So that's a really important concept that I want to point out here. You don't have to use like file path style naming conventions. You can just give things GUIDs or give them string or integer style names. You could do whatever you want. But if you happen to use something that looks like a file folder structure, you'll see it show up here, but the folders are not real things. They're just kind of inferred. So I hope that makes sense. It's a little bit weird if it's not what you're expecting, because if you thought that I made a directory and I made a file, that's not what happened. I only made the file. Once we deleted that file and there was no other sort of association with that uh, sort of uh, derived directory, it's not a real thing, there's no reason for Azure Blob Storage in the portal to show it because it never existed in the first place. So in this video, we've looked at some of the basics of working with Azure Blob Storage. But I wanted to touch on something that's a little bit interesting if you're building web applications. In this example, we were talking about writing some server-side code, most likely, where you want to be able to upload and read back stuff from blob storage. However, what happens if you have something like a back-end server and a front-end, and you want to allow your users in the front-end to be able to upload files to Azure Blob Storage? Or what if you want your users to be able to download stuff to the browser to be able to use in your web application? Do you need to be able to go from the front-end through your back-end server to Blob Storage, and then from Blob Storage back to your server to the front end? Or is there a different way that we can do this to not have to stream the bytes all the way through? Well, when that video is ready, you can check it out right here. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.